Thank you very much. It's so good to be here with you this morning. You know, I was one of those boys with a big appetite, you know, the kind that would stand at the refrigerator, open the door, grab a quart of milk, and just kind of chug it down. But, um, you know, the problem was that I grew up in a large family. We had, I had three sisters and five brothers. That and my mom and dad were very poor, and the food just never stretched far enough around our place. Uh, so I was very watchful at the table. My eye would go to the meat platter, and I was wondering who was going to start passing that meat and who was going to take the biggest piece, and was there going to be enough by the time it got around to me? Now, that's one kind of hunger. But Mother Teresa says there's a greater poverty than someone who has nothing to eat. And this, she says, is a hunger of people who are unwanted, unloved, uncared for, and forgotten. And these people are all around us in multitudes. So here's the really big question. How do we feed the multitudes? We're here from CMC, your conference, to talk with you about our commission to mature and multiply churches locally and globally. Grab this uh, paper here that you are given and turn to this side where it talks about our commission. And um, Phyllis is going to read the bold words on this and then follow along with me, read out loud with me um, the lighter print here. We won't read the references here this morning. So these are our commitments as a conference. And the first one is submission. Together, to God and his revealed word, to Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to each other in the body of Christ. Urgency. People are hungry for God. People are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Many are lost and dying and millions have no access to the good news. Jesus is coming soon. Discovery. We seek to thrive as image bearers of God. We explore ways to co-labor with the Father on the extraordinary mission he has called us to. We seek to develop and use every person's gifts and creativity to the fullest. Our leaders continually seek to continually adapt and learn in order to remain effective in our changing world. So as you can see, our conference is focused on that question, how do we feed the multitudes? Now, I don't know about you, but when this topic comes up, this topic of feeding the multitudes and evangelizing and church planting, my stomach sometimes clenches, and I feel guilt pouring in. This all feels too big and I feel too small, like I don't have what it takes. I wrestled with this question when I was a young pastor. How could I grow a new church in London, Ohio? I attended lots of seminars, read lots of books, sat in meetings at the missions office, Roseville Bible College with a lot of other people who were looking for answers. And I felt plenty guilty because I can't manage to feed people fast enough. And I'm tired of feeling guilty and pressured and harassed, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Our guess is that you too have felt these same tensions, especially if you're serious about Jesus' last words to his disciples before he went to heaven. Go and make disciples. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could all quit using up our energy with guilt, if we could quit laboring under pressure, if we could find the yoke with Jesus to be easy and light. And you know, Jesus performed a miracle that gives me hope. And he performed this miracle when the times were bad. Jesus' first cousin, John, has been arrested and then imprisoned. And then Herod, to reward his daughter for good dancing, beheads 
John and then delivers his head on a platter to his dancing daughter. So just before this miracle, John's disciples bury his headless body. Jesus hears all this and just withdraws to a private place. But the crowds follow him. And so Jesus teaches them. He teaches them about a kingdom, not Herod's kingdom, but a new kingdom. And then Jesus does a miracle for the crowds. He knew one day we would wrestle with this issue of the Great Commission and how to multiply. And so he did something. He did a miracle to show you how to do this. Watch this, he said. This will help. So just sit back and listen to this story. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread enough for these people to eat? And he only asked this, he, he only uh, asked this question to test him because he already knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to all who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them, and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. So let's just imagine this boy. There's probably some boys here about that age uh, here this morning. This boy had set out that morning in all innocence, carrying just an ordinary lunch, you know, like a brown bag lunch. Nothing fancy, nothing exotic in his lunch. Now, I brown bagged for 30 years while I was teaching school. Every morning at 6.15, I packed exactly the same thing. A peanut butter sandwich, carrot sticks, and a cookie over and over again. Just enough food to get me through the day. The food that was easy to get in my house. So what's in this boy's lunch? Well, bread, of course. Bread is so basic to this culture that to eat bread and to have a lunch is basically saying the same thing. Bread is also respected with rules that show almost a reverence for it. All crumbs that are bigger than the size of an olive are to be saved and not discarded. And bread is never cut. It's always broken. But the big question about bread is what kind? The rich eat wheat, the poor eat barley. Barley bread is heavier and thicker, and it doesn't taste so good. In the Middle Ages, barley bread was used as a punishment. Monks who were in trouble were given only barley bread to eat. And in his brown bag, the boy has barley, the food of his house. He also has two small fish, probably sardine-sized, smoked and dried like jerky. So, barley and jerky. You know, not much, but still, it's a lunch. And this boy, standing there in this multitude of hungry people, he has 
three options. Option number one, this is mine and I'm going to keep it. And if I had been there, I probably would have made and chosen that option. I probably would have slept off to a private place and thus just enjoyed my lunch. And the boy's probably tempted. I mean, after all, he's a growing boy. And you know how it is when you're hungry. You just can't think of anything but food. Maybe some of you are hungry right now. Let me help you. Buttery corn on the cob, a pot roast, sweet potato fries, double chocolate cake. You know, you're just restless for food. But for some reason, this boy begins to think beyond his own hunger. Around him, he realizes, are a lot of people with needs that need food. Now, we don't like this. None of us like this feeling, this encroaching of other people's needs on our needs. But I know some of you parents here with some newborns, I've heard them and seen them walking in here. You've been up with that baby at midnight and 2.30 and 4.30. You know what it's like to have needs encroaching in on your needs. I sat with a woman once at a potluck at another CMC church. I don't want to know what I know, she said. She was crying, barely able to talk. She had been, like the boy with the lunch, prepared for her own hunger and the hunger of her family. We don't have much, the woman told me, but we have enough. And then, like the boy, she started noticing the hunger around her. Hunger for food and love, hunger for meaning. So she signed up with an organization that matches people who care with people who have needs. And she got to know a single young mother with three-year-old triplets and two younger preschoolers. And she saw what she didn't want to see, what drugs can do, and violence, and neglect. She saw babies left too long in cribs and a young mother with drugged thinking. She saw preschoolers with bruises and with wary eyes, and she smelled filth. I don't want to know all this, she kept repeating. I'm broken inside. My world has changed. I want to go back to before, but I can't. This woman had lost her innocence, her chance to eat a lunch alone with her family under the tree and away from the crowd. She had found people who were hungry. You know, it's hard to enjoy eating in front of hungry people. <laughs> I mean, it's even hard to enjoy eating in front of a hungry dog who's looking up at you at the table wanting some of your food. So we stay away from people who are hungry, from people who are needy. And if they come near, we say, go away. I want to enjoy my own lunch by myself under a tree. Option number two for the boy. This is mine, and I'm going to manage it. Now, I'd like to think that if I had been in the crowd that day listening to Jesus, I would have thought, I can't keep this lunch to myself. But I'm quite sure that instead of taking the lunch to Jesus, I would have tried to manage on my own, work at the problem, figure out how to stretch my food. Philip was the disciple who tries to manage with common sense. I mean, Philip is one of those practical people like we are. He wants to get a hold of problems by using his senses. And when Jesus asks Philip where to buy food, Philip, Jesus really wants to know, Philip, can you rise above what you can see and feel? But Philip doesn't. He doesn't think of saying, we don't need to figure this out. 
We don't have to buy food. You can supply it, Jesus. Philip leaves Jesus out of the equation. He starts talking about wages, you know, common sense sorts of things. And I do this far too often. I'm an administrator. I'm supposed to have common sense. My job is to draft documents and plan programs and track costs. And I honor common sense far more than what Jesus can do. And Peter also tries to manage by problem finding. This lunch can't go very far, Peter says. Peter is one of those one people that like big and bold. And I'm like Peter too. I focus on what's wrong with this very little bit that I've got in my hands. This won't do, the disciples thought. It's too big for us. It's out of our reach. Let's avoid the problem. Let's just send the people away and they can get food wherever. I did this once. I was teaching at a prison school and during the midday count of inmates, I was in my office working hard. The librarian of the prison school came into my office and sat in a chair, just sat there. He had never done this before. I felt God prompt me to talk with the librarian, but I argued with God. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know the librarian that well. My afternoon classes were about to begin and I still had some work to do. Talking with a librarian seemed too big for the time I had. The end of Count Bell rang. The librarian got up from his chair. He left my office. He walked to the other side of the prison, walked to the library, unlocked the library door, and fell over dead. I had thought that the situation was too big for me, that I couldn't manage it. So I avoided it. I didn't think I had the resources to handle it. I had thought that my barley wouldn't do. And this is what happens to me as well. When I have my eyes just on my own resources and how I'm going to manage them, but there's a better way. Is it better way than just kind of keeping our lunch to ourselves or trying to manage them and make them stretch to meet the needs around us? This third option is better. And this is the option that this boy chose. Option three, this is God's and he is going to multiply it. The boy gives what he needs the most in that hour, food. And when he offers his lunch to Jesus, he takes a step out of his own agenda. His focus changes to kingdom work. What's amazing about this lunch is not what happens when the boy holds it. What's amazing is what happens when the lunch changes hands, when Jesus holds it. Jesus takes the bread, and the other Gospels tell us, looks into heaven and gives thanks. And what Jesus is doing here is connecting heaven with earth. That's what prayer does. It brings the perspectives of God down to the puzzles on earth. At a recent pastor's conference, we heard a sentence, one I'm trying to remember. Prayer is the work. This look to heaven keeps the vision clear. Jesus, as he walked the roads of Israel, kept talking about the Father's will, the Father's plan. This look to heaven keeps the, the kingdom agenda above our own agenda. But how quickly you and I turn to our own agendas. You know what happens at the end of this story? The people want to make Jesus a king, an earthly king, just that quick. They wanted what served their purposes, not what served 
God's purposes. You know that God can make something out of nothing, like he made the heavens and the earth by speaking words. He could have set a buffet for the multitudes with a word, but he didn't speak a banquet into existence. He wanted to take what was in the boy's hands into his own hands and bless it and multiply it. This is a really good story, isn't it? I mean, this is really cool what happened here. It's really great to read stories like this in the Bible. But you know what? It's not enough just to know about this story. You need to ask, in light of this miracle, how is this going to affect my life? How does this miracle intersect with my life right now? I mean, what do you do with this miracle when you go to work tomorrow or when you go to school? How does this miracle look around your dinner table? How can you enter into this miracle? Well, here's how. With what you have. What's in your hand, God asked Moses. And it wasn't much. It was a stick, an upgraded stick. What's in your house, Elisha asked the widow, and it wasn't much, just a single jar of oil. Rahab had a red rope. Gideon had a pitcher. Tabitha had a cloth. We're always busy looking for something that we don't have. But God wants to use what is in our hands, what is in our house. Even if it's barley, don't wait for wheat. Wishing you had what other people have, their looks, their passion, their gifts, their resources. All I had in my hands one evening was barley, that's for sure. I had a bad attitude that evening. I knew that I should write a note to a coworker about God's love for her, but I didn't want to. I didn't know exactly what to write. I was afraid the note might strain our relationship. But I wrote it, and I stamped it, and I put it in the mail, all with a bad attitude. Two evenings later at dinner, the phone rang again, and that put me into a bad attitude too. I have too many of these. You can ask Steve about that. I thought about not answering the phone, but I did. And then I heard heavy breathing, so I almost hung up. But I realized someone was crying, my coworker. I planned to kill myself tonight, she said. I had given God a three-day chance to show that he loved me. And if he didn't, I would commit suicide. Today was the day. But when I came home from work, I first checked my mailbox. And that's where I found the note about God's love. Teresa turned to God. Steve baptized her and her three daughters, one of whom became a church youth worker. That's what God did with my barley. We once knew a preacher named Jesse. Jesse cried when he preached. Sometimes so much he'd need to get his handkerchief out of his pocket and just mop his face off. And he didn't like this. He wanted to be eloquent. He wanted to be in emotional control when he was preaching. And so we asked God to take away his tears. And God did. But then the power went out of Jesse's preaching. The Spirit quit multiplying the words in the minds of the hearers. And so Jesse asked God to give him back his tears. I'll cry in the pulpit for you, he said. And the tears came back, and so did the power. Now God could use what Jesse had. We attended the funeral of a man named John Mishler. When he was younger, John had tried to plant a church in the hills of Kentucky. How could he reach the people, he wondered. What could work? We were in this church just in the last year, 
and a couple of generations later, the people still know what worked. It was a chain. During the muddy season when the dirt roads washed out in those hills, John pulled cars from the mud with his chain. They laughed at Mother Teresa when she wanted to build this great orphanage and just had three shillings. Well, it's true, with three shillings you can't build much of an orphanage. But in God's hands, those three shillings multiplied enough to build that orphanage. It's remarkable, this changing of hands. Listen to this sequence. From the boy, to Jesus, to the disciples, and to the crowd. The miracle didn't happen while the bread was in the basket. The miracle happened as the loaves were given away. So don't make the mistake of waiting until multiplication happens before you give. Multiplication always happens after you give. And how often do you miss participating in a miracle because you worry about how crazy it is to, to write a note to someone or to, to offer um, a sleepless night to a young couple who needs um, a, a good night of rest, or just give someone a squeeze on the shoulder who needs that. How often do you miss participating in a miracle because you, stop, you stay trapped in your own limitations instead of offering the little bit that you have to an unlimited God? With this miracle, Jesus is saying, you can try to feed people without me and feel stressed and pressured and angry and sorry for yourself. Or you can be glad to do your small part in a miracle, grateful you have barley to share, and then just be free to watch me work. You can recognize that I'm the multiplier and not you. All you do is show up with barley. Now this doesn't take away a sense of urgency. Remember, urgency is a commitment of our conference. It's a commitment of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't call you to an easy life. He calls you to give your life and to give it sacrificially so that others will follow him. Your soul was not made for an easy life, but it was made for an easy yoke. And your yoke can be easy when you know the difference between your job and God's. You show up with barley. God multiplies. You know, there was someone that I loved very dearly that seemed to me to be on the verge of walking away from his marriage, really away from his faith. And I felt helpless. Only God I knew could help this situation. But I was urgent because I loved this person very deeply. If I drive two hours your way, will you drive two hours my way? I asked him, and he said yes. But all the way there, I wasn't sure how I was going to be with him. What was I going to say? I had this CD along with me. It was a college chapel talk about marriage that my daughter had given me when she heard that I was meeting with my friend. I didn't think, though, that I would probably give it to him. I mean, it would probably offend him, a college kid offering a sermon to him. So over French fries and a hamburger, I stumbled around trying to show my love for him it wasn't a horrible meeting, but it wasn't a particularly good one either. But in the end, I gave him this CD. I'm not sure if I should give this to you, I told him. You might not like it, but here it is. It's from my daughter. And the sermon on that CD changed that marriage. And 15 years later, this couple is still together. That's what God did with my barley. What is your barley? Grab that paper again that we passed out to you. And this is going to help you think about 
your barley. If you see something written here on this paper that looks like you, circle it. If you have another idea for a category, write it in the blank there. And do this right now as we review this paper with you, okay? So you notice that the first category is your passion, something you love to do. Maybe you like kids or motorcycles or physical fitness. In that blank, write something down that you love to do. Maybe your barley is an experience, like maybe you've had a bad illness, or maybe you've done some traveling to some interesting countries. A lot of us, our barley is our job because we run into so many people there. Next, you'll see a list of spiritual gifts. Just run your eyes over that list, and if something looks like you, circle it. Your barley could be a possession. Maybe you've got some electronic games. Maybe you've got a basketball. Maybe you've got a barbecue grill. Your barley could be a skill. <clears throat> Maybe you're good at fixing cars or at academics or at cooking. Write a skill you have in that blank. Do you have a house? Make it a place of ministry. Children. Shape them into kingdom workers. An income. Give of your first fruits. With your hands. Serve. And your feet. Go. And if you have a talent. Use it for blessing. When you use what you have in your hands, what you have in your house, God multiplies it. What if we all did this? What if we all brought our barley like the boy did? Think about this boy later when he grew up, became a father and a grandfather. What did he tell his children? What did he later tell his grandchildren about this story? When he was a man, he probably participated in the Lord's Supper, celebrating a time when Jesus again took a loaf, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples. Imagine this grown-up boy reaching out his hand there for that broken bread there at that communion service and then remembering long, once long ago, I brought my bread to Jesus and he broke it and gave thanks and multiplied it. It wasn't much, my barley, but he took it and then I watched him work. What if we all brought our barley and then watched Jesus work? And what if we all prayed this prayer every day? Jesus, today I'll bring you my barley. Imagine the future of your church if each of you would enter into this miracle like the boy in his barley brown bag kind of a lunch. We walked one time into another conference church and saw this beautiful sight. Four large eight-foot tables filled with fresh homemade bread. Golden crust, just perfectly formed. Such fragrance in the room. But they didn't offer us any. For our homeless friends, they said. We do this several times a year, our favorite days. Loaves of bread for hungry multitudes, a miracle. Here's an idea yet in conclusion to help you participate in this miracle. Keep this paper handy somewhere in your house. And when you run across it, think, am I bringing my barley to Jesus today? Let's pray. 
Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to look at a familiar story. Lord, I pray that as we experience, even today, we are going to experience some opportunities that you're going to lay right in front of us here. And I pray that we will recognize those and courageously step forward and share our barley. And we just trust you, Lord, to do the multiplying. Thank you for each one who is here today. Give them courage, Lord, as they follow you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.